Christians read the Bible, the understandable focus is almost always on the nice parts. The problem is that there are parts of the Bible that aren't so nice, and those parts are starting to get a lot more attention. Seemingly strange commands condemning tattoos and the instructions not to eat shrimp, verses that seem to endorse slavery, brutal passages where God clearly commands the merciless killing of women, children, and even infants. How about the verses telling women they should submit and remain silent and can't say anything in church? Is God okay with polygamy? It seems like it. He's also okay with unicorns because they are in the Bible too. How about the rib woman who is told by a talking snake to eat fruit from a magical tree? What do we do with all the verses that make it feel like you're being forced to choose between the Bible and science? How do we make sense of all of this? Because it's all there in the Bible. If someone asked you, what would you say? If someone asks you, what would you say? My prayer is that by the end of this series, you will know exactly what to say. Uh, this is a six-part series on that 0.1% of the Bible that is the most difficult to understand and principles for dealing with that 0.1%. The title of today's message is Never Read a Bible Verse or You Will Have to Believe in Magical Unicorns. By the end of the message, you will know what I mean by this and what I do not mean by this. More and more, especially on social media, critics of Christianity are using that difficult 0.1% against us. Uh, let me give you an example of the unicorn. Here are three memes that you will find on social media. The first one, it says unicorns are mentioned nine times in the Bible. Cats are mentioned zero times. And that's all you need to know about the Bible. Uh, here's another one, Isaiah 34, verse 7. All the unicorns sh shall come down with them. And then it says, know your Bible. Uh, then here's a third meme. Uh, it says, because the Bible tells me so, picture of a unicorn, and then the passages in the Bible that uh, mention or seem to mention uh, unicorns, where they're supposedly mentioned. And so they're using these uh, against us, and as I'm going to demonstrate, and it, it's in a false way, it's in a misleading way, but it is being used in this way. Uh, Peter tells us how to answer these attacks. 1 Peter 3, verse 14, do not fear their threats and do not be frightened. Do not be frightened. Let me, the first thing I want to say right off the bat at the beginning of this series is, don't be frightened. We have the answers to all of these things. We have good answers uh, for all of them. Don't be, don't be frightened. Uh, frightened. Sometimes we panic and say, oh no, they're making us look like fools. Or oh no, they're, they're causing people to doubt the Bible. No, no, don't fear their threats. Don't be frightened. Uh, I've read many of these uh, atheist manifestos uh, like The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins or God is Not Great by Christopher Hitchens or Letter to a Christian Nation by Sam Harris. And I'm always blown away. I, you know, you, you start to read them with a little bit of fear saying, what am I going to find here? And by the end of reading those three books, I want to tell you, I just felt joy because I'm like, are, are you kidding me? That's all you've got? That's all you've got? You, you, you spent all that energy to find at least one crack in the facade of the Bible or of Christianity, and, and that's the best you can do? And I found it a very encouraging experience because I'm like, if that's the best they can come up with, then we uh, have our faith grounded on very, very secure ground. Uh, 1 Peter 3, verse 15 uh, Peter writes, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this, okay, this is the important part, do it with gentleness and respect. There is very little gentleness and respect on social media today. But we're called to be different to give answers, to be prepared to give answers. Uh, be prepared to give a reason why we believe what we believe, but to do it 
with gentleness and respect. Now here's a principle I want to start with. Beware the python hovering near the hamster. You say, Glenn, what in the world are you talking about? A couple of weeks ago, we're all together at the family. John and Natalia are, are just about to leave for Mexico with uh, Emily and Alejandro, and the four of them are about to head out as missionaries uh, to Mexico. So they were staying with us uh, for a week before they went. So we're all together at the house. And I said to our youngest son, Noah, I'd like you to go out and take the trash cans to the curb. So he comes, goes out to do that, and he, and he comes back and says, Dad, there's a python um, by the hamster. Now, what had happened is uh, John and Talia had a pet hamster that they were trying to get somebody to take care of before they left to Mexico. So we didn't want it in our house because the dogs would go after it if they had a chance or they would just be barking at it. So the hamster was outside of our house uh, near the trash cans uh, just sitting out there so it would be outdoors rather than indoors. And he goes... There's, there's a python hovering near the hamster. Well, our poor son, no, we didn't believe him. We said, yeah, yeah, right, Noah. So we all went out and we began to look around very cautiously because you, you all know how I feel about snakes. I am terrified of snakes. And I thought even if there's a 1% chance that Noah is right on this, uh, I, I don't want to stumble upon this snake. Well, lo and behold, he was right. Uh, there was a python hovering right next, coiled up right next to the hamster. Uh, we called uh, 911. Pomona was just great. Pomona Police Department called Animal Control. They were there like in 20 minutes. It was amazing. And here's the picture of the animal control guy right next to our house with, I'd say that's about a two-foot python that was hovering near our hamster. And I was never so glad to see somebody who would get rid of that snake for us. And so the hamster is like us. And a python is represented by the word deeper. The word in quotes, deeper, is the python that is hovering near us to attack us if it gets an opportunity uh, to do so. Now you say, Glenn, what do you mean by deeper being a python that, that is about to attack us? Uh, what do you mean by that? Well, that's the word to watch out for, deeper, in quotes. You see, deep is what we receive when we receive our faith. And, and somebody, a Sunday school teacher, when we're a kid, or uh, one of our parents or grandparents shares Jesus with us, and, and that's deep. And, and we receive Christ, and we follow him. But then one of these memes, like one of the ones I show to you, uh, gives the facade of being, quote, deeper. Oh, here's something deeper than the deep that you received. And people panic. And they think, oh, no, uh, deeper beats deep. And so they, they're threatening my, my, my faith. But what you do is you dig deeper now. What you do is you don't get afraid like Peter talked about, don't be frightened, but instead dig to the deepest. Go beyond, quote, deeper. Uh, go from deep, but go beyond when you're threatened by deeper to deepest. And when you dig beneath the surface, you will always find good, solid answers uh, for your concerns when your faith is under attack. Dan Kimball writes, here is the good news. There are ways to better understand these crazy sounding Bible verses. We must learn how to and how not to read the Bible. So let's go back to our unicorn uh, example. Um, yes, there are quote, now notice the quotes there, okay? Yes, there are quote unicorns in the Bible. Now, for every little girl under the age of 10, this is good news. Uh, my, my granddaughters would be thrilled to hear that you could combine the two loves of their life, Jesus, with a unicorn. They, they, would, they would be thrilled. This is good news for every little girl under the age of 10. But for everyone else, 
This is disconcerting. What are you talking about? Unicorns in the Bible. In the King James Version, Numbers 23, verse 22, God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of an unicorn. Uh, Isaiah 34, verse 7, also in the King James translation, and the unicorn shall come down with them. So we ask the question, are unicorns, without the quotes around it, are there really unicorns in the Bible? And the answer is a resounding no. Uh, I just want to say sorry to the little girls of Purpose Church. Um, uh, this accusation is based on faulty and misleading information. Most Christians today would never see the word unicorns in their Bibles. They would see a more accurate term, which is wild ox. Uh, the only place you can still find the word unicorn is in the King James Version, which was translated in 1611. It's not even in the new King James uh, Version, only the one from 1611. This translation was commissioned by King James I, and the scholars at that time used the very best Hebrew and Greek texts available at the time. They did an excellent, they did a wonderful job with the text they had. Um, the New Testament was written in Greek, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. With the text that they had at their disposal, they did the best job that they could. Now, the, the situation with our more contemporary translations is, is that we have discovered all kinds of even older, more ancient texts um, in the 400 years since the King James Version was translated. The last 400 years, archaeologists have found much better, much older, closer to the original uh, text uh, over the last uh, 400 years. Um, the King James Version also used words like thee and thou because the people living in 1611 used thee and thou. Now today we use you or her or him for thee and we use my, your, hers, his for thy. And so contemporary Bible translations use words that make sense to the readers they are translating for, just like the translators did for the people who lived in England in 1611. So where do we find references to unicorns? The word translated unicorn in the King James Version is the Hebrew word reem. And this word was used uh, between 1400 B.C. and 700 B.C. when these verses were written uh, in the Bible. And scholars today tell us that it referred to an animal during that time period that had great strength and a prominent horn. In 1611, they didn't know how to translate it. So they looked at a Greek translation from the 2nd or 3rd century B.C. called the Septuagint. And those translators used the Greek word monokeros, um, the Greek word monokeros, which literally means one horn, mono, one, keros, horned, one horned. So the King James Version translators used um, the word unicorn, which in 1611 meant an animal with a prominent horn. They absolutely didn't mean it to represent the mythical, magical, one-horned horse that we think of today. Uh, if you were to think of a one-horned animal or an animal with a prominent horn today, you would think of a rhinoceros. Interestingly enough, the scientific name for the Indian one-horned rhino is Rhinosaurus unicornis. Rhinosaurus unicornis. That's the scientific word we use for rhinoceros today. And when the Old Testament was being written, there were various one-horned and multi-horned animals, uh, prominent horns in existence. Uh, the original writers of the Bible would have been familiar with the now extinct but very large and powerful horned oxen that the Assyrians called Remu. Uh, today we know there also once existed an animal uh, that is now extinct, which scientists refer to as Elis mother, mothertherium sibicaricum, uh, which was an extremely large single horned bull. Now, it was uh, extinct earlier before the Bible was written, but it could have still been present in the oral history uh, at that time. Uh, number, so now, 
we come to a modern translation, a contemporary translation, the New International Version that we, that we use most of the time here at Purpose Church for those same two verses that we looked at in the King James. Numbers 23, verse 22. God brought them out of Egypt. They have the strength of a wild ox. Isaiah 34, verse 7. And the wild oxen will fall with them, the bull calves and the great bulls. So, were there unicorns in the Bible? The answer is yes. There were one-horned animals, a variety of oxen, an animal the people would have been familiar with. But were these animals the white, magical, mythological horses with one horn that we think of today? Absolutely not. So back to our principle again. Deep is the God's word. Deeper is so-called unicorns in the Bible that is a complete um, mishandling of that passage, an inaccurate handling of that passage. Deepest, which we've just done, shows that there are good, solid uh, evidence for what the Bible is actually talking about, how we do read the Bible, how not to read the Bible. And so here's, here's the principle right here. Receive deep. Receive God's word. It's deep. Beware of, quote, deeper. People that come to you and say with a verse out of context or something and say, oh, look, there's, there's a problem with deep because we've gone deeper. Pursue deepest. Dig beneath the surface and you will find the answers that you're looking for. Now, here's an important principle that is going to sound um, very wrong at first. So let me explain quickly. Uh, here's the principle. The Bible was not written to us. You say, Glenn, what, what, what are you talking about? Okay, well, it's a, it's a difference in prepositions, okay? So hang with me. It wasn't written to us, but it was definitely written for us. Dr. John Walton, who's an Old Testament scholar at my alma mater, Wheaton College, he writes, we believe the Bible was written for us, that it's for everyone of all times and places because it's God's word. But it wasn't written to us. It wasn't written in our language. It wasn't written with our culture in mind or our culture in view. So we have to figure out what God was saying to the people it was written to and then see how that now speaks to us today and how it applies to us uh, today. Now, why do we call uh, it the Bible or sometimes we call it the Holy Bible? My daughter, our daughter Leah, um, when she was in high school, uh, worked for Steve and Paul Albrigo from our church family here when they owned a Christian bookstore in Covina. And she said there was this one sweet older lady that came in and she wanted to look at Bibles. And, and Leah showed her all kinds of different translations and a women's study Bible and a leadership study Bible and, you know, all the different varieties of uh, Bibles that are out there today, showed her every one they had in the store practically. And the lady was like, no, that's not it. That's not it. That's not it. And finally, Leah went to a top shelf and, and, and pulled one out that said, Holy Bible. And she goes, that's it. <laughs> she was holding out for not just any Bible, but for the Holy Bible. And, and you know, that, that, that's sweet. There's a good reason on many of our Bibles. Some it doesn't say Holy Bible, it just says Bible. But on, on many, it does say holy, and it's highly appropriate. Holy means set apart. And Christ followers believe that God has set apart and made distinct the writings collected in the Bible. They're sacred because they are set apart by God, because they are from him. Uh, the Bible refers to itself as the holy scriptures. Romans 1 verse 2, the gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures. 2 Timothy 3 verse 15, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now the writings of scripture became known as the Bible sometime in the Middle Ages, and even more so with the invention of the printing press in 1436 and the mass production of Bibles spreading uh, it around the world after the invention of the printing press. And so Bible 
uh, in the Greek means a biblia. Bible that we say today is from the Greek word biblia, which means books. Now notice, books in the plural. That's very important. And that leads us to four truths. Number one, the Bible is a library, not a book. It's actually a collection of 66 books, uh, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, actually a collection of 66 books printed in one volume, but it's a library of books. And I tell you what's miraculous about the Bible is that it was written in three different languages on three different continents over a 1,500-year period. Uh, some of the parts of the Bible were written a 1,000 years after other parts of the Bible, 1,500 year period, by 40 very different people from sometimes very different cultures, and yet it has one cohesive message because it was written by one author. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, above all you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. Uh, but in verse 21, for prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets through human, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So even though there were over you know, 40 different authors and over 1,500 years, three different continents, all kinds of different cultures, different countries, um, uh, different languages, uh, even though all that was so different, it has one cohesive message. Why? Because there's one author behind the scenes, and that author is God. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 15, 16, 17 all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So think of it as you're entering into a library. And uh, you walk into the library, and here's the law section, and then followed by the history section and the poetry section, the major prophets, the minor prophets, uh, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the biographies of Jesus, the history of the early church called the book of Acts, then Paul's letters, then the general letters written by others like Peter and John, and an apocalyptic, meaning the, the second coming of Christ uh, revelation that we studied um, all through this past uh, summer. And like I said, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament, for a total of 66 books in this library. Now you treat what you read differently depending on what section of the library that you're in. For example, the poetry section um, is uh, filled with uh, poetic, uh, strong images, sometimes even exaggerated images to, to touch our hearts. And you interpret the poetry section very differently than you interpret the history section, for example. You come to the law section, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. As you read a law book, you pay attention to when it was written and where it was written because many of the laws change over time. And there may be different laws for different geographic areas, different countries, different cities, different states. Uh, for example, a law book from Germany in 1580 AD contains laws that apply to that time and in that culture, but they may not be applicable or even understandable uh, for us today. So for example, and in the book of Leviticus, here we find it, third book of the Bible, Leviticus, this is often used to attack the Bible and the Christian faith, but remember, the laws found in the book of Leviticus were written to the nation of Israel in 1400 B.C., 3,400 years ago. And there are laws that don't apply to us today. Now, the principle behind the law may apply, but not the specific law itself. You know, this series kind of sets up, it's going to take us up to the Christmas season in December, and, and then starting in 2023, this series really, after Christmas, this series sets up in 2023, 
we are going to go through all 66 books of the Bible in 52 weeks. And we're going to cover, like the first Sunday in January, we're going to cover Genesis. Second Sunday in January, we're going to do Exodus. Third Sunday, Leviticus, and so on. You say, well, how are we going to do 66 books in, in, in 52 weeks? Well, we'll combine when there's First and Second Samuel. We do, we'll do that in one week. Um, we'll, we'll combine uh, a certain books sometimes, do, do them side by side, like uh, Ruth with Judges and that kind of thing. And we're going to cover all 66 books in 52 weeks in 2023. And I think it's going to be the greatest year. Um, year number 153 is going to be the greatest year in the history of Purpose Church as we, as we do this. Okay, second truth. The Bible was written for us, but not to us, just like we, we just talked about. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved a worker. Understanding the meaning of the Bible for your life is work. You got to be a worker who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth. Now, if this implies that some people handle it incorrectly. If the challenge from Paul here to his young pastor, Timothy, that he's mentoring, is make sure you correctly handle the word of truth, it means that some people handle it incorrectly. Just like the unicorn memes that we looked at earlier. That is handling uh, the Bible, God's word, incorrectly, okay? It, it, it's doing it uh, in a non-correct way. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, Peter is writing about Paul. He, Paul, writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand. Isn't that good? Isn't it good to know that it's okay that certain parts of the Bible are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction, intentionally distorting things by taking them out of context or using them in a way that they're not supposed to be used. Now, now here's just a, a good illustration to help us um, kind of uh, get, get, get a hold of this. Um, it's from uh, Dan Kimball, and, and I love what he uh, writes here. He says, there was a song that came out in 1963 called Puff the Magic Dragon by folk artist Peter, Paul, and Mary. The chorus contains these lyrics. Puff the magic dragon lived by the sea and frolicked in the autumn mist in a land called Hanali. Uh, the song was extremely popular and even reached number two on the music charts. Around that time, there were the beginnings of a countercultural revolution with a new generation starting to reject the social and ethical values of past generations. Drug experimentation was becoming more prevalent and in the thinking of younger generations, the song Puff the Magic Dragon was rumored to be something more than a children's song about a mythical dragon. People began interpreting the lyrics based on their worldview and saw it as a song written about marijuana smoking. Newsweek magazine even had a cover story about covert drug messages being part of the songs. The rumor, based on the cultural views and assumptions of the time, was that puff was an obvious metaphor for smoking pot. Autumn mist, another part of the lyrics, was understood to be a symbolic reference to clouds of marijuana smoke. And the land of Hanalei was interpreted as a reference to the Hawaiian village of Hanalei, which was known for its particularly potent marijuana plants. Um, I took Kimberly there for our anniversary to Hanalei a couple, couple of summers ago. I want you to know, I had no idea. <laughs> Now, let me ask you, how many of you remember that, uh, that rumor going around about Puff the Baggage and Dragon? I, I totally remember that. Then one day, the authors of the song made a statement to clarify what they meant when they wrote the song. They clearly and emphatically stated the song had no reference or hidden meaning whatsoever to drug culture. Co-writer of the song, Peter Yarrow, said, when Puff was written, I was too innocent to know about drugs. 
What kind of a mean-spirited person would write a children's song with a covert drug message? And the other co-writer, Leonard Leonard Lipton, said Puff is about loss of innocence and having to face an adult world. It's surely not about drugs. I can tell you that at Cornell in 1959, where where he went to school, no one smoked grass. I find the fact that people interpret it as a drug song annoying. It would be insidious to propagandize about drugs in a song for little kids. And then Dan Kimball finishes. He says, I share this to show how easy it can be to take our worldview and then press it into something we read or hear, interpreting it through our lens. We can look at specific words and dissect them and use complicated contemporary analysis to do all this. Eventually, though, we need to step back and look at the more fundamental question, what was the author originally saying? We cannot simply read our own understandings into the meaning of a word or statement someone else wrote or said. And when we look at some of the bizarre sounding parts of the Bible, we have to try to discover who the original audience was and view the text through their lens, not ours. If we don't, the possibilities for confusion are endless. And then truth uh, number three, never read a Bible verse. Now, Obviously, this is an exaggeration. There are times when a single Bible verse is just what you need. But when it comes to understanding its meaning, we need to look at its context. Uh, I don't know if you remember the old joke about a guy that was going to find out God's will for his life. So he just let the Bible fall open, put his finger down, and read. Judas went out and hanged himself. He said, oh my goodness, that, that can't be it. So he tried again. Opens the Bible, lets it fall out. Go thou and do likewise. He said, no, 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 that can't be it. So he opens it again, puts his finger down. Whatsoever thou doest, do quickly. (laughs) Okay, well that's exactly an example of what we're talking about here. Greg Kokel writes, if there was one bit of wisdom, one rule of thumb, one single skill I could impart, Uh, one useful tip I would leave that would serve you well the rest of your life, what would it be? What is the single most important practical skill I've ever learned as a Christian? Here it is. Never read a Bible verse. That's right. Never read a Bible verse. Instead, always read a paragraph at least. Now again, that's a bit of an exaggeration. It's wonderful sometimes to, uh, to find an encouraging verse But it's still a helpful thing to remember that when we're trying to discover the meaning of a verse, always read it in its context. This is one of the primary ways that we see the Bible being used against itself by critics of the Bible. Uh, A single verse is pulled out of context and it's placed on a visual or on a meme, uh, possibly even a rented billboard. Uh, Here's a, a good way to read the Bible. Uh, Look at the specific Bible verse. Then look at the paragraph that the verse is in. Then look at the chapter the Bible verse is in. Then look at the book of the Bible that the chapter and verse are in. Then look at where the book of the Bible the verse is in fits into the Bible's whole storyline. Here's an example that may help. Imagine taking just one line uh, out of context from uh, the Star Wars uh, trilogy, or actually, I guess there's nine movies all together. Uh, taking this one line, just for once, let me look on you with my own eyes. Just for once, let me look on you with my own eyes. Now, if you only had that line, you could go in a dozen different directions. But when we look at the context of that line, we see it as Anakin Skywalker, also Darth Vader. Hope I didn't spoil it for anybody there. Spoiler alert, Anakin Skywalker is also Darth Vader, saying it while being held in Luke Skywalker's arms as he's uh, about to die. Luke has learned that Anakin is his father. As he is dying, he asks to have his mask removed so he can see his son Luke with his own eyes, not through the mask covering his face. It's a pivotal scene in the larger Star Wars storyline But without the full story, it wouldn't make much sense on its own. Uh, Here's another example. 
Uh, I love Lord of the Rings. Uh, one of my favorite set of books and favorite set of movies. And uh, I just love, love, love Lord of the Rings. But it wasn't always that way. <laughs> When I was in high school, for some reason, the only one of the Lord of the Rings we had in our house was the middle one, the two towers. It's the only, for, I don't know why we had it, just bought it somewhere in a bookstore, picked it, just the middle one. And so in high school, I started reading it. And I was clueless as to what was going on. I hadn't read the first one, so I had no clue. And I remember reading it for just like 10 or 20 pages and saying, this makes absolutely no sense, putting it down, uh, only to discover it years later and fall in love with it because I started, actually I started before the Fellowship Ring with The Hobbit and then went to the Fellowship Ring. Then I understood the two towers and on to the return of the king. Uh, so you got to look at everything in context, the storyline of the Bible. It comes in, in six acts. Uh, there's act number one, God creates and dwells with his people. Genesis 1, chapters 1 and 2. Act 2 is humans rebel. And that leads to act 3, where redemption is initiated. Genesis chapters 3 through the book of Malachi. Then act 4, act 4 is redemption is provided uh, through Jesus in the Gospels, the biographies of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Act 5 is a mission to all the nations. Book of Acts through Revelation chapter 21. Act number 6 is redemption is completed. God is back to dwelling with his people as he did in Act 1 with the new heavens and the new earth, no more sin in Revelation chapter 22. And so when you understand what you're reading in the context of the storyline of God's plan through history, it all begins to make sense. Uh, let me just use one uh, final example of this. Um, some or even many Christians are vegetarians. But you don't have to be a vegetarian in order to be a Christian. And yet this verse is used to say that you must be a vegetarian to be a Christian. Genesis 1, verse 29. Then God said, I will give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. But you see, uh, death entered after the sin of Adam and Eve and, and, and the fall of humanity. And after that, animals die and so God allows for them to be eaten as well. Genesis chapter 9, verse 3. Everything now that lives and moves about will be food for you, just as I gave you the green plants, I will now give you everything. And then in Luke 24, Jesus eats fish. And in Luke chapter 22, he eats the Passover meal, which included lamb. And so if you look at that verse from Genesis, that first verse I read to you, in the context of all of, of God's plan, then all of a sudden you realize it means something very different or it does not mean something that it seems to be. And then truth number four, all the Bible points to Jesus and Jesus loved, Jesus loved this Bible. Luke 24, he, Jesus, said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things? and then enter his glory, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. You know, the unifying theme that we're going to use in 2023 uh, that unites all the books that we're going to look, all 66 books, is we're going to look at Jesus in every single book of the Bible. And I think we're going to call the series Jesus Cover to Cover because he's in every book. He's the unifying theme. Well, uh, as, as we close our time together, uh, what a marvelous time we had last Sunday with our 150th anniversary. It was, just, it was just amazing. And one of the highlights was we saw uh, people giving congratulations from all around the world uh, in our own backyard as well as all around the globe congratulating us on our 150th. And there are some that have come in 
after uh, last Sunday, and I want to share a couple of them with you as we close out our time. Uh, this past um, um, Wednesday, uh, Pastor Sham and I were talking to a man at a Pomona leadership meeting that has had a huge impact on Pomona and just, just is being used by God in just an unbelievable way. And I, I was just amazed to hear him tell his story that he used to be um, one of the homeless on the streets here in Pomona. He was addicted to drugs. He was homeless. And he talks about during that time in his life, he would come to our church um, for, for ministry. Uh, he, he would come to our church for, for food, uh, for our homeless ministry. Uh, he'd come here to get meals. He'd come here to get food. He'd come here for our clothing ministry um, and, our, and our food ministry. And then he, he came to Christ. He got clean and sober. And today, for decades now, Craig Chisholm has been the pastor of the Pomona Valley Christian Center. That's what he is now. But for decades now, he has been on fire serving the city of Pomona. And he all, he just talks all the time. Sham says he brings it up to him every time he sees him, what our church did for him during his time of need. And look at him now. And then a closing greeting from Pastor Marithi uh, in Nairobi, Kenya, who started Rooted that we use here at our church. We consider his church to be a sister church to ours in Kenya, and he wanted to give his greeting, and so let's finish our time by listening to what Pastor Marithi wants to say to our church on the occasion of our 150th anniversary. Hi, Papa's Church. Uh, my name is Pastor Muredi Wanjao, or Pastor M, uh, Senior Pastor of the Mavuno Movement of Churches that is based in Nairobi, Kenya. And we, your brothers and sisters, we just want to come alongside you and say, Happy Birthday, 150 years. Oh my goodness, what a feat, what an amazing thing. Our prayer is that your best years are still ahead of you. And that the things that you're going to accomplish in the next 150, should Christ not have come back, will be far greater than anything you've even seen before now. Our prayer for you is 1 Corinthians 2.9. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined the things that God has in store for those who love Him. God bless.